she was wherever you are, whether in your kitchen, in your living room, or in your car, are you worshiping? Can you just worship the Lord? Hallelujah, for he is near, for he's right there beside us. He walks with us, he talks with us, he tells us that we are we are his own. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Happy first Sunday of July. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. I hope that you have logged on today and you bought your own praise. How people bring their own lunch. I pray that you have bought your own praise. So why don't you open up your mouth and bless the Lord with me. So I want to just start over just giving God something from the fruit of our lips. It doesn't matter whether you dialed in from your bed bedroom, your basement, or on your couch. Open up your mouth and give God what you owe him. We're always talking about what God owes us, but have you calculated January and February and March and April and how he kept you in May and June and you've made it to the first Sunday of July? Why don't you go ahead and wave your hands and tell God Thank you. I know you're home. I, I know that it's a lot going on, but would you magnify the Lord with me after this week, after this month, after this year? I was glad when they said unto me, let us, you and I, go into the house of the Lord. You are the house of the Lord. I know that we are virtual, but I still came today with my hands lifted up and my mouth filled with praise, with the heart of thanksgiving decreeing and declaring that I will bless thee, O Lord. I will bless thee, O Lord, because I know that it wasn't a face mask. I know it wasn't just because I was washing my hands or taking sea moss. I, I know that it's only because of the Lord's mercies that we have not been consumed because his compassions, they fail not. This is a great place for somebody to testify on this Sunday that if it had not been for the Lord on my side, where where would I be? I would have fainted. I would have lost my mind. I would have lost my peace. I would have lost my joy, but he kept my enemies away. He let the sun shine through a cloudy day. He didn't stop there, but he wrapped me in the cradle of his arms, even when he knew that I was weary, tired, and torn. So if it had not been for the Lord on my side, I don't know where I would be. God is good. God is good. I didn't say that the times that we were living in are good, but I said that the Lord is good and his mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. Don't you dare forget that worship always requires your participation. Worship is not a spectator sport. Happy first Sunday of July to you. Grace and peace to you, to each one of you. I bring you greetings in the name of our Father, Jesus Christ. I miss you all, but I am so grateful for the gift of technology that allows us to still connect week after week and month after month. For all of our first-time visitors, I am Pastor Akisha, the servant leader of First Sundays, and I welcome you. We welcome you. If this is your first time joining us, wave, say something, let us know that you're here, post something so that our members can show you some love and give you some virtual hugs. If we were in the sanctuary, I would come around and give you a hug, but today I send you virtual hugs from my house to your house. Welcome, welcome, welcome on this Sunday afternoon. There are so many places that you could be. And so I'm grateful today that you have tuned in for all of our frequent flyers, for all of our members. Happy first Sunday of July. I miss you all. I pray that you all are safe. I pray that you all are secure. And I pray that you all are in your sound minds. We're going to get right back. We're going to get right to um, the word of God today. If you will grab your Bibles. Um, if you have a phone, you can grab it and we'll put the scripture on the screen. Um, this morning's scripture, this afternoon's scripture rather, will come from the prophet, uh, according to Isaiah, the sixth chapter, verses one through eight. Um, when you got it, say amen. 
description will be on the screen um, for your convenience. Um, Isaiah 6, 1 through 8. And the Bible says this. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted and seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him was seraphim, seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they were flying. And they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorpost and the threshold shook and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I'm ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. The one of the seraph, then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, see, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, who shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here I am, send me. But the scripture that I really want to focus on this afternoon is verse number one. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. For the time that is ours this afternoon on this first Sunday of July, I want to talk under the direction from the Holy Ghost, from the thought of, can anything good come out of a bad year? Come on, repeat it with me. Can anything good come out of a bad year? Let's pray. Father God, we give you thanks. God, we give you glory. God, we give you honor. And God, we most of all give you praise. God, we thank you today for this opportunity that you have given us today to connect to you. God, and most of all, to connect to one another. We thank you today for the blessed gift to hear your voice and to come into your presence. We lift up our empty cups to you today, God, and ask that you would fill us up again like only you can. Inspire us, invoke us, uplift us, challenge us, correct us, change us, encourage us, and empower us, God on this day, in this moment, with your word. Oh God, I've studied, but I need your spirit, God. I've prepared, but oh God, I need your power. It is in the name of Jesus that we do pray. Would somebody say amen, amen, and amen. Can anything good come out of a bad year? June 10th, 1952, October 31st, 2000, November 22nd, 2003, May 25th, 2013 may sound like just dates to you, but these are actual dates that changed my life. My dates are not your dates and your dates are not my dates, but we all, if we're honest, have dates that are pieces of our story. We all have dates that are meaningful to our history. We all have dates that help us pinpoint and remember chronologically when certain events and certain points and certain seasons occurred in our lives. Maybe your date is an anniversary date. Maybe your date is a birth date. Maybe your date is a graduation date. Or maybe your date is a date when you got a phone call with some news about a loved one or a friend that changed your very life. Even though time has changed and years have passed, there are some dates besides December the 25th and January the 1st and February the 14th and April the 1st. There are some dates that we just remember without prompting. Our dates are so significant that all we have to do is think about the date and tears of joy or tears of sadness come to our eyes because Something so significant happened on that date that changed the very fabric of our lives. 
On yesterday, America celebrated its birthday. America celebrated her independence. And people all over the country waved flags, lit fireworks, fired up grills, jumped in pools, went to beaches, which is customary on the 4th of July. But America's recollection of independence and our recollection of, the, of independence don't trigger the same response. That's why Frederick Douglass was invited to come and give a speech on the 4th of July in Rochester in New York in 1852, but he showed up on the 5th of July and he said, I showed up a day later because I don't celebrate the 4th of July. And history records his question to the crowd and then records his answer. Frederick Douglass asked, what to the American slave is the 4th of July? I answer, a day that reveals to him more than all the other days in the year, the gross injustice and cruelty, which he is the constant victim. To him, your celebration, America, is a sham. Your boasted liberty and unholy license, your national greatness, your swelling of vanity, your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless. Your denunci denunciation of tyrants and brass-fronted impotence, your shouts of liberty and equality, hollow mockery, your prayers and your hymns, your sermons and your thanksgiving, mere boast, fraud and deception and hypocrisy, then a thin veil to cover up the crimes that disgrace a nation of savages. <laughs> there is not a nation on the earth, Frederick Douglass said, that practices more shocking and bloodier than are the people of the United States in this very hour. Oh Lord, we can date certain events in our lives by the year in which they happen. From 1941, the year Pearl Harbor was attacked and America went to war in 1963, the year that President John F. Kennedy was assassinated to 2001, specifically when 911 happened and America was under attack from Black people's Juneteenth to the temptations testifying that their papa was a rolling stone. And, and, and the singer said, it was the 3rd of September, the day that I always remember, the day that my daddy died from June 10th to Prince's 1999, from Prince's 19. 1999 to Drake's March 14th. From Drake's March 14th to Jay-Z's December the 4th. These aren't just numbers. These are numbers associated with stories that reconnect them and reconnect us and reconnect our hearts and our minds to history. Some of our years have been powerful. Some of our years have been purposeful. Some of our years have been tough. Some of our years have been easy. Some of our years we've cried a lot. Some of our years we've laughed a lot. Some of our years we've won. Some of our years we've lost. Some of our years have been painful. Some of our years have been healing. Some of our years we've been been torn down and some of our years we've used building back up some of our years have been tranquil and some of our years have been chaotic some of our years have been abundant and some of our years have been uncomfortable but one thing for certain and two things for sure, there are years like this year where preachers don't talk about them much because we tell you, we preach to you when, you know, when blessings go up, uh, pr when praises go up, blessings come down. But there are some years that there are some incidents and there are some events that are so significant that just like this year, 2020, that 2020 will go down in the foul cabinet of our souls as a life-changing year. Which brings us to the heart of our conversation. King Uzziah wasn't even a man when the people picked him to be the king. He didn't even have hair on his chest, y'all. 
he wasn't even old enough to order a drink when they picked him to be the king. He was still a boy. He was just 16 years old. And for 52 years, King Uzziah reigned. He was known as a spiritual man. And the Bible says that he did what was right in the sight of the Lord and the people. Before he made a decision, he sought the Lord. Before he got on Twitter, he sought the Lord. Before he opened his mouth, he sought the Lord. Before he held a news conference, he sought the Lord. And because he started out with not just with the Bible in his hand, but he had the Bible, the word of God in his heart, and he sought the Lord. And because he sought the Lord, he was able to lead wars and win wars. He was able to rebuild cities that had been torn down. He was able to fortify cities that had been weak. He was able to build towers for visibility and protection. He was able to direct soldiers and lead an army. King Uzziah was the man. King Uzziah was strong and sane and sound. And under King Uzziah's leadership, the economy was popping. The, 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 the businesses were booming. People were prospering. Money was moving. Building projects were going up everywhere. Unemployment was low. Crops were growing. And because King Uzziah sought the Lord in the beginning of his reign, the people were winning. So King Uzziah, he wasn't just a good king, but he was a success king. His approval rates were through the roof. King Uzziah had millions of followers on Instagram. King Uzziah had millions of followers, of followers on Twitter. The people love King Uzziah. But let me tell you something. It's dangerous when you let people's compliments go to your head and you let their criticism go to your heart because you lose your humility. So King Uzziah, he didn't end like he started because he started relying on God, but he ended relying on him. He started strong, but he finished weak. And King Uzziah, he got a case of the big heads. And the Bible said that God punished him and the king died. And we don't know, church. We don't know the exact date that he died. We don't know the time that he died. We don't know who was there when he died. We don't know if he TMZ or world star broke the news that he died. All we know is that he went from royalty to leprosy. Everyone knew the king, but Isaiah really knew the king. Everyone loved the king, but Isaiah really loved the king. Everybody knew of the king, but Isaiah was close to the king. Isaiah didn't just follow the king on Instagram. He had the king's telephone number in his cell phone. Isaiah didn't just follow uh, uh, the king on Instagram, but Isaiah had gone to the king's palace and had meals with the king, had sat on the king's couch and kicked it with the king. And now the only king that, that, that Isaiah has ever known, the king is gone. The king is dead and the people are reminded just how fragile life can really be. Their world is suddenly turned upside down. And just like that, just like that, their world has gone from security to uncertainty. Just like that, they've gone from an overflow to a recession. Just like that, they've gone from a calm to a crisis. Just like that, they've gone from being problem-free to chaos. Just like that, they've gone from the year went from going good to going bad. The king's death and the king's loss was so significant. If the king's death was so monumental that the prophet said that every time that someone asked him about the king's death, he would reach back in his file cabinet of his heart and he would remember what street he was driving on when he heard that news that the king died. He remembered the song that was playing on the radio when he heard the news that the king died. He remembered the clothes he was wearing when the news broke that, that the king died. And he says in the year that King Uzziah died, he said, I saw the Lord high and lifted 
I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. That's good news because I, I, I was able to call Isaiah because I don't talk to people who ain't never been through nothing because they can't tell me anything. And so I had to call Isaiah, y'all, because in the year that King Uzziah died, his year sounded like our 2020. And you know where it seemed like our world has been turned upside down. You know where we've gone from security to uncertainty. I had to call Isaiah because he had lived from he had lived in a in a year where he went from calm to a crisis. I had to call Isaiah because he lived in a time where things went from good to bad fast. So I called Isaiah and I had to ask him the question. I said, Isaiah, can anything good come out of a bad year. Isaiah said, absolutely, sis. He said, in the year that my king Uzziah died, just bless me, he said, I became woke. I said, what did you say, Isaiah? He said, I became woke. He said, the year that my king Uzziah died, he said, because what was designed to break my heart actually opened my eyes. <laughs> he said, in the year that my King Uzziah died, he said, I was able to see that I had been depending on the King more than I had been depending on my Creator. He said, in the year that my King Uzziah died, I took my eyes off of my struggle and I put my eyes on my Savior. He said, the year that my King Uzziah died, that was the year that I ran out of oxygen and I realized that God was my only option. He said, tell the people that the year that my King Uzziah died, that was the year that I saw systems fail and structures being taken down and statues coming down and they were crumbling all around me. But I still, I still saw God standing and sitting on his throne. He said, the year that my King Uzziah died, I took my eyes off of who died. I took my eyes off of what died. And I fixed my eyes on the God who still lives. He said, when my King Uzziah died, he said, tell the people that I took my eyes off the test and I put my eyes on the throne. He said, in the year that my King Uzziah died, I took my trust all the people and I put my trust back in God. He said, in the year that my King Uzziah died, I went from hearing God. I went from just hearing God. I went to seeing God. The year that my King Uzziah died, he said, tell the people that that was the year that they closed the church and I became the church. He said, the year that my King Uzziah died, I, that was the year that God allowed things to go left so he he could get me right. The year that my King Uzziah died, he said, tell the people that that was the year that I realized that even with my best plans, even with my best vision board, that God was still in control of my life. And Isaiah's heart was broken because he was, with what he was counting on was gone. Isaiah's heart was broken because who he was counting on on. It was gone. And while the people were posting on Instagram crying that the king died, and while the people were holding candlelight visuals that the king died, and while the people were getting t-shirts made and, 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 and posters made with the king's um, face on it, the Bible says that the prophet gets up and he goes to the temple, which isn't a big deal when you're reading at first church because he's a preacher. He belongs in the temple. He's a prophet, y'all. He belongs in the temple. And, and, and so it wasn't a big deal. But when I kept reading, when I kept reading about one o'clock in the morning, what I realized is that it wasn't until King Uzziah's, uh, it wasn't until 
King Uzziah died, that Isaiah saw the Lord. In other words, Isaiah had been to Bible study week after week. He had been to revival after revival. He had been to service after service. The priests were always in their praying, but Isaiah didn't hear them. The singers were always in their singing, but Isaiah didn't feel them. Sacrifices were always being offered, but Isaiah didn't smell them. It wasn't until his king Uzziah died that he was able to see the Lord. I told you he said he got woke. It wasn't until he went in empty that he came out full. It wasn't until he went in God's presence, lifting up his cup, that he came out with his cup overflowing. It wasn't until he went into God's presence, out of options, that he, that he found God to be his only option. And I want to tell somebody today that's dialed in on Facebook Live, and I want to tell somebody today that will watch this later at the end of this year you will be able to testify on December the 31st 2020 that it wasn't my CMOS, it wasn't my ginger shots it wasn't my doctors it wasn't my medicine it wasn't by my might it wasn't by my power but in 2020 I saw the Lord Somebody will be able to testify on December the 31st, 2020, that it wasn't until my strength died that I saw the Lord and he was high and lifted up. It wasn't until my plans died that I saw the Lord. It wasn't until my comfort zone died that I saw the Lord. It wasn't until my peace died that I saw the Lord. It wasn't until my doctors were scratching their head that I saw the Lord. It wasn't until my loved one died that I saw the Lord. It wasn't until my job died that I saw the Lord. It wasn't until the structures and the systems died around me that I found the Lord. I, I saw the Lord. Would somebody say, I saw the Lord and he was high and he was lifted up and his train filled not just the temple, but it filled my mind so depression wouldn't drown me. And his train filled my house, not so that I'm not just the temple, but so that that the crisis and the chaos wouldn't drown me. We're about to go, church. But before we go, I don't know about you, but I am sick and tired of bad news. We are bombarded all day, every day with bad news. You can't hide from it. It comes on your phone. It's on the TV. It's on the radio. Every, if you turn left, it's there. If you turn right, it's there. And so if you're not careful, all of that bad news and toxic people and negative people will make your heart sick. And that's another thing in this season. Guard your ears. Guard your eyes because there are some people that are just so negative that their spirit will make your spirit sick. And so um, a few weeks ago, God told me to post. He said, he said, Keisha, he said, I need you to start posting good news stories on your social media page every Friday. He said, because my people are losing hope and I don't want them to lose hope because this is just the season and they're coming out of this. And so the first week I shared a story of one of our faithful members who's been on a transplant list for a while. And so she, re she received a kidney about two weeks ago, even in the midst of a crisis. And so I posted her story and she's, in, she's still in the hospital and she's doing well. And we're believing God for a total, total, total recovery. But last Friday, I posted a story about a man. His name is Cedric Meekins, who lives right up the street in Baltimore. And I heard about his story from one of our servant leaders, my best friend Rhonda. And, and, and Rhonda had reached out to me a couple of months ago and asked me to pray for him. I never had met him. I never saw him, but he was in trouble. And so I reached out to him so he could tell me his story. And he said, he said, Pastor, he said, in March, he said, I started feeling like I had the flu. He said, I went to urgent care twice just to be sent home. And he said, returning home, I felt like I had the flu on steroids. He said, my symptoms intensified. And he said, eventually they got so bad that I called 911. He said, when I got to the hospital, they confirmed that I wasn't just sick, but I was very sick. He said, the doctors confirmed that I had COVID-19 and 
I was only breathing at a 40, 47% capacity. He said, it wasn't looking good. He said, they placed me in ICU and placed me on a, in a medically induced coma and immediately placed me on a ventilator. He said, uh, it wasn't looking good, Pastor. And I wasn't there, y'all, but I can only imagine that the exhausted doctors who were looking at dead people and dying patients, I know they probably scratched their head and looked around the ICU and looked at all these people and dying and death lurking. And I know they probably asked themselves, can anything good come out of this? And for the next 11 days, Cedric was in a fight for his very life. But what the doctors didn't know that he wasn't the only one in the ring. And for 11 days, uh, Cedric, he was in, he wasn't conscious because he was in a medically induced coma coma and 11 days later doctors weaned him off the ventilator and he opened his eyes and he and he looked up and surrounding his bed in his hospital room was a team of doctors and nurses and they were looking at him and looking at the machines and they were looking at his vitals and looking at the machines they were looking at his blood work and they were scratching his head and they were trying to figure out how in the world did he make it through because the man on the right of him came in with the same thing but he didn't survive the man on the left of him he came in with the same thing but he didn't survive either but what they didn't know is that before they put cedric under cedric said pastor he said i didn't know how bad it was he said but i the Lord. I don't know what Cedric said to God, but I know what God said to Cedric because he told me. He said, God told him that I need you to believe. I need you to believe that you're coming out of this. So what doctors didn't know is that the death angel, the death angel had his address, but the death angel didn't have his name. And I've come to tell somebody today that Something good is coming out of this year. Something good is coming out of this season. Something good is coming out of this trouble. Something good is coming out of this crisis. Something good is coming out of these tears. Something good is coming out of your unemployment. Something good is coming out of your midnight walking the floor. But you got to stop looking down and you got to look up. You got to stop watching CNN and Fox and start looking up. You got to stop complaining and you got to start looking up. See, it's one thing for you to hear about God, but it's another thing for you to actually see God's handiwork. And I stopped by to tell somebody this year that this year that you're going to see God in all his glory. It's one thing for you to have heard that God was a miracle worker, but this is going to be the year that you're going to see him work a miracle. It was one thing for you to hear that he was a way maker, but this is going to be the year that he's going to make a way for you. It was one thing for you to hear that he was a promise keeper, but this is the year that he's going to keep his promises. And so you ask the question, can any good thing come from a bad year? And I want to tell you, yes, Miracles come from a good year. Signs and wonders come in a good year. People don't come off of ventilators. Don't miss that. People don't just wake up from a coma. And I talked to Cedric today and he was at work. He was in a medically induced coma in March. And on the first Sunday of July, he said, Pastor, I'm at work. And I want to tell somebody today, can anything come from a good year? And I want to tell you, yes. But one thing, another thing that comes from a good year is that you're going to get woke. Can anything come from a good year? Yes. You're going to see God for who he is. He is the Lord of glory. He is the architect of the universe. He is the mightiest of the kings. He's unmoved. He's unchanged. He's unbothered. He's undefeated. He's Adam's redeemer. He's David's music. He's Ezekiel 
loose wheel in the middle of the wheel. He's Luke's physician. He's the sinner savior. He's unparalleled. He's unsurpassed. He's unshakable. He's powerful and majestic. He's far beyond your greatest ability and your comprehension. He holds every second in his hand. I'm just going over his resume because somebody needs to hear it today. He, he holds every second in his hand. He, he, he directs the ocean. He tells the moon when the clock out and he tells the sun when the clock in. He doesn't need a nap, a vacation, and he doesn't require time off even because though even though the world is in chaos he's always in control nothing takes God by surprise because he was he is and forever will be and his train fills the temple of my heart his train fills the temple of my body his train fills the temple of my soul there is there is no room for anybody else in the places that he occupies He's Alpha and Omega. He's the first and the last. He's the author and the finisher. He retains all, all authority and power in heaven and earth and the White House. He uses his unlimited power. He has free will. There is no virus stronger than him. There is no army bigger than him. There is no devil mightier than him. Can anything good come from a good year? Yes, sis. Yes, brother, we can, in a good, in, 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 in something else, we get our priorities in order in a bad year. Because God reminds us who's number one. He reminds us what's number one. And when we see God for who he is, then and only then will we start seeing ourselves for who we are. The year that King Uzziah died, is the year that Isaiah realized that he had some things seated where God was the only one that should have been seated. In the year of 2020, the year that your King Uzziah has died, I've come to tell you that you've got to realize that you weren't just created to wake up and go to work and pay bills and die. You weren't just created, but you were called. God assigned a purpose to your DNA before your mother and father went on their first date. Your life has a purpose and you're going to miss it if you're not careful because it's not wrapped in a box with a pretty bow. You're gonna miss it if you're not careful because it's gonna come disguised as a prophet. Abraham's call came as a sacrifice. David's call came in a field. Moses' call came in a bush. Mary's call came in a manger. Jesus' call came on a cross. Cedric got a new song on a ventilator. Isaiah's call came in a bad year. And your call is coming in a pandemic. And if you're not careful, you're going to miss it because you can't get past your plans and your vision board and who was supposed to help you and who was supposed to be there for you. The Lord said the rules have changed. You're still cold. Hearing God and seeing God are two different things. God has to become your number one. God is our source, not the things that he gives us. We have to look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. We have to choose this day whom we will serve. Will it be God or will it be our King Uzziah? But whatever you do, you've got to know that something good always comes out of a hard year. Some of you are ready to write the year off. Some of you are, you're, you're already counting down to January. 
but I don't want you to miss the moment of what God is telling you. I want to open up the doors of the church today. The first call today is for someone who needs to give their life to Christ. Giving your life to Christ today is the most important decision that you will ever make. Right where you are in your living room, in your bedroom, in your bed, in your car, in the shower, in the bathroom, it doesn't matter. The Bible doesn't say you have to be in a particular room. The Bible just says that you just need to confess with your mouth that Jesus is your Christ. Confess your sins and believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. And if you do those things, the Bible says that you're saved. If you want to pray the prayer of salvation today, one of our prayer partners will pray with you. Call or text us, email us, send us a note on Facebook, and we will follow up with you immediately following the service. But you can repeat after me right now. Right now, I confess Jesus. You are my Lord of my soul. You are my number one priority. Thank you for making me your number one priority. With my heart, I believe you, God. I believe that you raised Jesus from the dead. And from this very moment, I accept Jesus Christ as my personal savior, according to his word. Right now, I am saved. If you pray this prayer of salvation today, please let one of our digital readers know or, our care, or one of our care partners and we'll follow up with you. My second call today is for someone who is in, a, in our cyber sanctuary, that's listening to the words that are coming out of my mouth. And you know that you need to bury some King Uzziahs. Some things need to be buried. Some people need to be buried. Some thinking needs to be buried. Some habits need to be buried because you have them in God's feet and they have to be dethroned. Because as long as they are out of pocket, as long as they're out of place, you will never see God high and lifted up. If that is you today, we want to pray with you. Let us know in the, in the comment sections. And as soon as this service is over, we will pray with you. We will call you and pray with you. Our third call today is for someone who doesn't have a church home. And... You have a hairdresser, you have a barber shop, you have a favorite grocery store, but you don't belong to a church. First Sunday is doing church out of the box. We've been out of the box. We have not been called to build the church. We've been called to build you. We would love to have you on our team. I would love to be your pastor. If that is you, let us know in the comment section and we will call you as soon as this service is over and welcome you to the church house. Send us an email or hit us up on one of our social media pages and a care partner will get back with you. This is the time in the service that everyone has the opportunity to participate. It's offering time. Can we thank God that it is offering time? There is absolutely nothing that we have that God did not give. We don't ever want to get a King Uzziah big head that this gift that I had is because I'm so big or I'm so good at what I do because of me or I have this because of me or I, I drive this car because of me. I make this much money because of me. No, boo. If God called, you would crumble. So every perfect and every good and perfect thing that we have, it's not ours anyway. It's God's. And so we give it back. We give a portion back to him. Your offerings, which you give, make it possible for us to do ministry. What you give, what we give, it makes it possible for us to do what God has called us to do. It makes it possible for us to be the hands, the face, and the feet of Christ. First Sundays is good ground for you to sow in. And I want to thank you for your consistent partnership of your giving. Because of you, we are able to be the hands, the face, and the feet. And I, and I hear this, and I want to share this. Um, I receive $150 every month for my work, for my assignment from First Sundays. I don't take a salary. 
I can preach tune up Thursday, every Thursday. I can preach, I can $150 because God takes care of me. So you're not giving to me, you're giving to the house. We simply cannot do this type of ministry without you. So today I invite you to give three different ways. Givelify, firstsundays.net, or Cash App. It is because of your hands, your face, and your feet that we're able to be the hands, the face, and feet of Christ. As people are giving, I'm going to ask that our music ministry will prepare our hearts and our minds for communion. So if you will grab your communion elements um, after you give, um, after the selection, we will take communion together. Fathers, we prepare to take of the body. We are grateful that you would allow people like us to be connected to a father like you. As we approach the communion table of the Lord Jesus Christ today for the seventh time this year, we know that it was some people that started out with us in January that are no longer with us. There were some people that were with us in February that have crossed over to the other side. We know there were people that had plans for March and April and May and June but they've also, they've entered into their heavenly reward. So God, we're grateful today to, for this opportunity to be able to come to your table one more time. God, we confess, Lord, any sin that we have committed by thought, word, or deed before we take up your body as we approach this communion table for the seventh time this year. God, we, we confess, we remember, we don't have amnesia. We remember how you gave your body and shed your blood just for me. We remember how you gave your body and shed your blood just for this season. We remember how you shed your body. You, 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 your body was broken and your, and your blood was shed just for this virus that we're going through. And the Bible says on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And after giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples. And he said, this is my body, which this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us all eat together. It is in the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. On this first Sunday of July, we know that it wasn't for you. We know that it was nothing but the blood that was shed for us on Calvary, that we are here. Jesus, we can't not calculate the price that you paid for our debt and our sin. We thank you, God, today for redeeming us. We thank you, God, today 
for saving us. We place the communion cup over our head as we, as we do month after month and year after year. We place it over our heads as a reminder to our minds that we are under the blood of Jesus. We are under the blood of Jesus. Our minds are under the blood. Our families are under the blood of Jesus. Our money is under the blood. Our children are under the blood. Our bodies are under the blood. Our ministry is under the blood. Our marriages are under the blood of Jesus. Our homes are under the blood. As a reminder to our minds that we're under the blood. As a reminder to worry and depression, we're under the blood. As you lower your cup, I want you to say, I am under the blood. Let us all drink together. Let us now recite the Lord's Prayer together. Come on, I can't hear you. Our Father who art in heaven, I can't hear you. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into, into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Somebody say amen. Listen, something good is coming out of this. Please do me a favor and join me in keeping um, our sister, um, Nakisha Lockwood, um, who is a faithful servant leader of First Sundays and her family in your earnest and sincere prayers. Um, her 20-year-old cousin, Jordan, um, uh, became the 79th homicide in Washington, D.C. over the weekend. But we know that Jordan is not just a number. We know that Jordan is not just a hashtag. Um, and so we want to uh, uh, be mindful that Jordan was loved, she lived, and she will be missed. And so we want to make sure that we are covering our dear sister Lakeisha in our prayers, in our thoughts, and most of all, in our, in our hearts. If you're not getting our emails, um, you are missing out. Please subscribe on our website to firstsundays.net. Um, you can also send your telephone number. You can get our robo text messages that we send just as reminders. Don't uh, put us in your spam folder or ignore our text. Um, we don't, uh, we won't uh, burden you down with a lot of texts or emails, but we want to make sure that you stay in the know. Just because we're not physically connected, we want to make sure that we stay connected. Uh, we have some ex very exciting ministry events going on uh, to keep us connected, and I challenge you to stay a part of that. During the month of July, on last Thursday, I kicked off a summer series on Tune Up Thursdays entitled Summer School. Um, and last Thursday, uh, uh, I taught on from the thought of I'm not coming out of this season empty handed. And so everybody left with homework and I pray that everybody's been working on that. And so I'm excited about the next couple of Thursdays, how we're going to hear God speak to us, um, resuscitate us, ignite us, push us in the season that we are in. Listen, until we meet again, make sure God is number one in your heart, number one in your mind, number one in your priorities. Make sure that God is number one in your day. Make sure that God is number one in your week, number one in your month, number one in your giving. Make sure that God is number one in your family. Make sure that God is number one in your business. Make sure that God is number one in your marriage. Until we meet again, know that I love you, but God loves you so much more. Happy first Sunday of July. God's richest blessings upon you and your family. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye.